Okay, so um, I wanted to talk today about model structure. Um, within so so on Monday, we talked about why we model, and we talked about why we build dynamic models, and we talked about three different types of dynamic models that all share this this basic property of, of dynamic models in general, to wit, they represent the state of some system over, uh, over time. They represent state at a given point in time, and that state evolves in a way that depends. How it evolves will depend on the current state. So um, we talked about three different traditions that illustrate this. For example, in system dynamics, we have these, these building blocks called stock and flows. Um, and stock and flows, uh, you may remember, uh, are uh, each associated with um, a, we, we delineate state in terms of the values of stocks, these, these accumulations. And there are changes in those stocks that in general depend on those stocks. So if there's no one susceptible, there's not going to be any new infections. If there's no one infectious, there's not going to be any new infections either. No one to give to, to you know infect other people. Um, so in general, the the state of a dynamic model depends on its current state. Um, and, in, and in stock and flow models, we capture state with these accumulations. Uh, within the model Bryce uh, and uh, Narges and Paul presented, there was a uh, illustrative stock illustrated having to do with level of concern regarding um, uh, colorectal uh, cancer screening. Um, and it was, uh, there were inflows associated with, um, with influences and outflows associated with decay of, of, of the impact of old influences. But um, it bears to note that these stocks, by extension, can be at the aggregate level, like counting a number of people, or they could be at an individual level, like within an individual, like in that model, with, which Paul had, where the stock was for that person. And in fact, uh, you'll find no shortage of models out there, including many contributed from my group, where we have stocks within a person capturing aspects of uh, maybe it's chronic stress or, or allostatic load or aspects associated with immune system and memory. Um, for particular pathogens that, that wanes over time in response to not seeing that pathogen, um, or dynamics uh, associated with uh, tolerance levels for, for particular compounds like opioids. Uh, and there's a dynamics associated with tolerance. So system dynamics is this mechanism for characterizing um, the dynamics of a system where we have feedbacks and we have these accumulations. We use stocks and flows to illustrate it. Another form of um, uh, another form of, of modeling you've been seeing a lot of is agent-based modeling. And here, state is captured in, amongst other things, state charts. It's also captured in, for example, variables like how many. How many of my prescription do I have uh, currently in my medicine chest? Um, how many doses do I have remaining, for example? Or you might have a state chart which says my current state with respect to commitment to behavior change um, is at the contemplation level. Or my, my state chart with respect to pain is that I'm in chronic pain, but I'm currently untreated for chronic pain. This might be a state uh, capturing aspects of state with respect to these uh, at an individual level with respect to these uh, uh, these broad categories and sort of uh, categorical uh, divisions. And we're going to learn how to read both these types of diagrams. A third type of modeling that I mentioned yesterday, but I won't be go or mentioned Monday, but I won't be going into has to do with uh, discrete event modeling. And if we if we uh, end up uh, opening that method of modeling in some of these models, I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. But today I wanted to focus most of my efforts on the two prevalent types of modeling you're seeing in this event, to wit, uh, agent-based modeling and system dynamics modeling, 
recognizing that a lot of what's emerging here is hybrids between the two. And that's, in fact, what you see some elements of Paul's model moving towards. Okay. Um, so that was my, my thought. Both of these are dynamic models, but we capture state and change of state differently. So I'd like to start with, with uh, state charts. And you've seen a number of state charts from the models that have been presented thus far. I'm showing you a different one here, but this shares with the models that you've seen some characteristics. You have, for an individual, um, they have state charts associated with different concerns. Um, so there might be a state chart associated with uh, their, their, uh, whether they've passed away, whether they're currently alive, or whether they're in an overdose state. There might be a behavior change state chart that captures their situation with respect to behavior change, and a state chart associated with pain status, uh, chronic, non postoperative pain, and then a behavior state chart associated with whether they're disordered from opioids or high functioning. These might be these might illustrate different different um, sort of aspects of a person's underlying state. And with respect to a given state like this, a uh, given state chart a person is going to be in exactly one of these states at a given time. Now, I'm fibbing a little bit. It's exactly one of these simple states, these smaller states. And as we'll see, we can group states together and, in ways that are hierarchical. And, and that has some subtleties, but I'll come back to that. So say with respect to behavior change, I may be at the contemplation level. With respect to my my level of functioning, maybe I'm high functioning, I'm I have a physiologic dependence on opioids, but I'm, um, I'm able to go about my daily activities in a way that, um, that keeps, uh, keeps my job, keeps my, um, my family structure intact, and so I'm, I'm comparatively higher functioning. But perhaps I am in chronic pain, and uh, I, am, I have a prescribing physician who's prescribing me opioids. So if we consider these state charts with respect to a given state chart, I'll be in exactly one state at a given time. And these transitions, as you learn today, illustrate actions that might bring me from one state to the other. For example, if I'm in a high-functioning state uh, with respect to opioids, over time I have a risk of becoming disordered, of, of my life falling apart. You know, I'm, I'm my partner decides to leave me, um, uh, you know, my, I, I lose my job because I'm no longer a, a functioning, um, high-functioning employee, and I might transition to a disordered state accompanied by dysphoria and a, a greater and greater propensity to use uh, opioids to dull the pain. So that transition could reflect a change in status from high function to disorder and uh, it might occur over time. Contingent on me being in a high function state, I'm subject to this transition, which takes me from high functioning to disordered state. Or if I'm in a, uh, a state associated with chronic pain, for example, um, and I'm, I'm untreated, then perhaps over time I will find a physician who prescribes it to me. And so I might transition along those lines. Or perhaps I have post-operative pain and I lose my pain eventually post-operatively and go back to a state of being in a no-pain state. Okay, So state charts, like stock and flows, as, as it turns out, both of these package together in a single diagram three basic types of things. Number one, possible states, the states of the system, the sort of the aspects of what does it mean to describe the system's current situation. Stocks and flows, you're specifying a value for each of the stocks. For a state chart, by contrast, you're specifying for a given person what state they're in with respect to each of these state charts in turn. And they could be in, in general, um, uh, there are exceptions, but in general they can be in uh, you know, any particular state of this one and, and that one and that one and that one. But, as Patty asked this morning, it's not the case that these are solitudes. They're not independent of one another. My likelihood of going from a high-functioning state to a disordered state will be higher under different circumstances. For example, 
Um, if I am a, uh, a current user um, and I start to use street drugs, which have highly variable dosage associated with them, um, that may make it more likely that I engage that I whoa, suffer from uh, suffer from an overdose. Um, uh, or that I go into a disordered state, um, you know, lose my job because I'm, I'm whacked out on fentanyl and, and can't, uh, can't keep uh, functioning at the level demanded by my employment. So what I'm saying is, generally speaking, if you're in a state with respect to some of these state charts, it will affect your transitions in that state chart as well as other state charts, okay? So my current, how I change over time is dependent on my current state. And in general, that's a feature of dynamic models. How they change depends on their current state. We saw it earlier with, with uh, infection. Um, if, again, if we have no susceptibles, we're not going to have new infections. How the system changes depends on its current state. If there's lots of susceptibles, we might get by and large, quite a few infections, as long as we have some, some infection effective people, some people who can spread the infection. So how the system changes depends on the current state. In state charts, we describe those rules uh, a little bit differently. We'll, for example, put a, uh, an arrow from contemplation to preparation, meaning if you're in a contemplation state, you have a certain chance of going into the prepar a preparation state from there. If you're in an action state, you have a chance of going on to a maintenance phase or into a prep state according to the you know, trans theoretical model um, of health behavior change. Um, that's one way we describe this dependence on state. Um, another way, we'll sometimes have one state chart depend on another and we will do so with a message. That's what this message is here. So um, this is a little envelope and that generally means that to go across here, either need, something needs to happen in a different state chart or maybe someone externally influences me in a way that, that influences whether I'm overdosed. So, a given, so state charts and stock and flows are both ways of bundling together the state of the system, illustrated in stocks there or state charts here, the rules by which that state can evolve, illustrated with, with transitions here and with flows here. And finally, the rules under which those actions take place of so going from one to the other. For example, um, with a system dynamics model, my, the rate of recoveries will be determined by how many infectious people there are and some average recovery delay. And the number of new recoveries will be, if it takes 10 days to recover from your illness and you have 1,000 people infected, the idea is that on average, if it's 10 days on average, about 10% of them per day will, will, will go on, uh, recover from infectiousness and become temporarily immune. So be infectious divided by 10, this mean time that they spend there. This is a parameter. It's kind of an assumption we put into the model that specifies how long I'm in that state. So for stock and flow models, we specify the rules by which we, the, the actions occur, by which things change according to <laughs> equations. There's underlying equations here. Um, by contrast, if I'm in a stock and flow model, excuse me, a, a state chart to sort of context, the rules by which these things change are encoded in these transitions. And I'll go dive into one. So, so, so state yeah. charts, these are for within agents. Right? Yes, almost so. normally. You could have a state chart that's more general. It's like maybe it encodes spring, summer, winter, fall. It's like for the system as a whole at a high level. You could have that, but Typically, these are within agents. So within, usually within person, and the other one, the big distinction between them is that the other one is aggregating. Most bundle, commonly bundle, in health. Bundles of individuals in general. Most commonly. Right. But so what you will see in some of the models here, and in many of the models we've contributed elsewhere, um, like that model with the ACT, with Freebaron and so on, you actually have stocks and flows within a person, reflecting their physiologic state. 
for example, their beta cell mass and function as it affects their uh, insulin, their capacity to mount an insulin response to high glucose levels. Um, so you could use stocks and flows there as continuous quantities characterizing my physiological state. So, but traditionally within health, <coughs> aggregate models have been most common for system dynamics. Um, and, and these are counts of people. Yeah. And means. these have the, the arrows represent the rate of change yes. over time. That's right. Not that they cannot be tuned up and down by other That's right. factors in the model. Exactly. But those are the rates of change to transition from one to another Precisely. versus in the other one. It's, it's probabilities um, of transitioning per unit time, for example. Um, so, so, for example, if we consider this, um, you know, I, I, I can pick a couple of these. In general, when you see a transition like this, you'll notice it's associated with a, an icon. You see that? Each of these has this little sort of icon. And, and if you look closely, there's, there's actually... Uh, three major types of icons shown here. There's, in general, five types of icons you'll find somewhere in models, but some of them are more specialized, like when I arrive at my destination, then I do something. So I'm going to talk about the three, three types shown here most prominently. One of them is this one that looks like, uh, it's, it's probably hard to see from where you are, but I'll, I'll whoa, I'll zoom in here. Um, sorry. Um, I'll zoom in so you can see this a little bit more closely, at least the appearance. Um, boom. Hey. Oh, man. Two, 200. Okay. There we go. Um, so here you, you see this, and it almost looks like uh, for those who are statistically uh, savvy, you might recognize this as something like an exponential distribution, so like an exponentially uh, 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 giving the, the residence time, and, and for example, in, in some quantity, it, it looks kind of like this, and indeed that's what it represents um, graphically um, and logically. So if we go in and look at this, what you'll find is this is called a rate transition. It's actually dependent on a hazard rate, okay? So for those familiar with biostatistics, you may know, know the nature of hazard rate. It's basically, it's not a probability, it's a probability per unit time. So it's like, this is saying 10% chance per week, 0.1 per week. I have a 10% chance per week of going from a contemplation state to a preparation state, okay? This was a, um, uh, this is a model that Alan contributed to, amongst other things, um, and Bryce, for that matter. The, um, uh, so here, with these sorts of transitions, we specify some sort of quantitative rate, and it's a hazard rate at a technical level, probably per unit time, of going from one to the other. And that might change. For example, my chance of falling back into cigarette smoking may be higher at first shortly after I've quit cigarette smoking because I still have a high, high degree of of uh, metabolic sort of need for uh, and psychological need for nicotine. But over time, um, my body uh, will get, will impose fewer and fewer cravings and I might have a lower hazard rate of falling back into smoking. You know, if I stay quit for two months rather than two days, I'm much less likely on a per day basis to fall back into smoking after, after two months compared to two days. We know that from the literature, we know it from statistics, and there's several reasons, including some aspects, uh, you know, in the statistics associated with heterogeneity, but a lot of it comes from the fact that physiologic craving does decay over time. If you can stay quiet for two weeks, your chance of falling back into smoking is a lot less than if you've just been quit for a day, on a per day basis. So this is a hazard rate, and this allows us to specify a rate, and um, in most commonly, that rate is some constant, but it might be dependent on other states that I'm in. For example, maybe my likelihood of going to a preparation state is higher if I have many, um, uh, uh, many people in my family who are supportive. So I have a good social support network. Maybe that would make that higher. And often we capture those sort of um, 
uh, we, we capture formulas that try to express that in the model. And so, in general, a transition like this might depend on my state as expressed in other, other state charts, for example, or in my network. So this is one sort of the three types of transitions. So that constitutes a formal flow. That is a indicator. You have to be a little bit careful. It is, it is like a flow in some ways. If we think of this as an aggregate model, you could think of each person, each susceptible person, having a certain chance per unit time of flowing here. Um, and that would, be a, that would be exactly analogous exactly analogous when you're thinking at an individual level for that to this. Where it becomes different is something Patty emphasized, which is these flows in a model like this, which is an aggregate model, if I were to ask what's the rate of flow here, this will be something like, you know, if there's a, a, a thousand people infectious and your average recovery time is 10 days, then on average one-tenth of those, one over 10, will recover per day, and so there'll be about 100 per day going down this. And so this flow will be associated with 100, meaning 100 per day people. So that would be a, an aggregate quantity. But if you think at the level of an individual, each person would have a chance of 10% per day going from here to here. And that's exactly analogous to this. Okay? And, and in fact, you can often translate directly from a stock and flow model to an individual-based model like this. Um, uh, taking into account that consideration. But I want to introduce uh, two other types that are highly prevalent here. Um, one type is this, okay? Um, th this one with a clock. Um, if I made it much bigger, it would look like Big Ben. Um, but this, this clock, this is what's called a timeout transition. It's not a hazard rate. It specifies after some predictated period of time, I will go from this state. If I'm in the post-operative state, I will go to the no-pain state. And sometimes we approximate things that are very defined duration with this. So, for example, this is saying in half a week, you know, I will go from a post-operative pain state to a no-pain state. Oversimplification here. This was a thought piece model we've built up. Um, uh, to, to explore ideas on, on characterizing opioids. But it captures the fact that sometimes we have a defined notion of how long things take. And sometimes it's specified as a constant. Other times we draw this constant from a distribution. So maybe there's a, you know, a, a, a timeout associated with how long my physician's appointment um, will take place uh, for a colonoscopy, right? M maybe I'm undergoing colonoscopy. How long is that appointment in hours or minutes, right? Um, maybe there's a distribution. If you look in the literature that characterizes the length of a colonoscopy, it takes into account a long tail on the upper side dealing with, you know, the occasional... Um, uh, the occasional error involved, but um, but maybe is concentrated around you know one hour or whatever. The point is, you could draw from a distribution associated with these two. It doesn't have to be a fixed number, but not uncommonly, just like hazard rates are most commonly, the most common ones still have a, a an assumption that's a, a, a certain constant. This this is very commonly uh, a constant. Um, within models. But this is a fixed amount of time. You, you pre-specify, you know, when you come in here, you, you either draw a number or you just use a value and say, after that amount of time, I'm going to the no pain state. So this is different from a hazard rate, where it's kind of like I'm getting a, every day I'm getting a kick in a can, do I recover? That's like a hazard rate, you know. Here it's, it's, it's that I'm, after some period of time, I am going to that state. Okay? Now, I can't is your mouse on top of that? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So it, it is just the clock. Okay, thank oh. you. It's, it's just, so I'm just trying the clock. So oh. You were trying to distinguish it from no. the other kind of clock, but no. they're all the same. All the clocks mean after specified time, you go to the other all, one. All the, all the, yeah. Four what? Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't, this, uh, uh, so I'm not sure 
th this this looks to me like a problematic thing because it's it's basically <laughs> if someone's in a no pain state, they're going to be going into a post operative pain state every one day, which would be most unpleasant. Um, so I I, um, I you know I, I need to talk with Bryce about that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, now, um, you'll notice this one, for example, an opioid, an overdose. Um, it's saying after one day of being overdosed, um, there's some probability that someone dies. That's what this branch, remember that branch from this morning? This is a branch transition. So it's saying, okay, this is a, a, a timeout transition. So after a day, I will then determine with a certain probability death occurs or, or by default, that's what the dotted arrow is, I stay alive, okay? And you might r recognize that this, this transition might in general, I suspect here it's just characterized as a, as a um, probability, the so-called random true, I have a certain death rate from overdose. But that, in general, might depend on something like availability of Narcan, of naloxone, right? Um, so if, if naloxone is, is widely available, my chance of dying from an overdose, subject to an overdose, um, my chance of dying from that is probably materially lessened. And that's where we could characterize something like that in a, in a function there. And, and by default, I remain alive. And then I might go between these. So, so this is a timeout transition, but it's associated with the branching. And you'll see this branching quite a bit in some of these models for certain purposes, particularly where de decision-making is made or with respect to an initial state. So here, you may notice, and you may see this in a, in a poloid model or, or perhaps a Bryceian model. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so... Sometimes you will see um, you will see something like this for this behavioral change state chart. You'll notice that there's this kind of odd bar over a dot, and then there's this branch. What that's indicating is you start up here. You come in is is where what this dot circle uh, the the circle and the the bar over it. You come in here, and for this state chart, so for for the state chart to the right here, it's a little bit simpler, alive and overdose, you always go to the alive state. But for the behavior change state chart, it distributes you initially among one of a set of states. Either you're in the maintenance state or the action state or the prep state at the beginning. This indicates it's dividing the initial population up amongst a set of states, often according to some statistics on prevalence in the population. Okay, um, So that's what that initial branch means. But uh, I promised you three major types of transitions, and I'm making my way to the third here. That's this one here. This is what's called a message transition, okay? Um, this is a transition where basically it indicates some, somewhere else in the model. Maybe it's somewhere else in another state chart for this person. Maybe it's some other person um, does something or this other state chart transitions in such a way it triggers this. It's kind of like there's a there's an external trigger that says make this happen. Okay. Um, a classic example of this that comes up in health services delivery is you know the healing hand of the physician, right? Physician heal thyself. Um, but it's the healing hand of the physician that may allow someone to recover from a chlamydia infection through antibiotic treatment to then, to then uh, be, be cured of that, uh, of that infection. So that might take, as it were, a, you know, an, an active sort of trigger, the, the, the delivery of antibiotics, maybe partner-assisted therapy, but, but commonly from the STI clinic to transition someone. So this is not so much uh, used for things which just arise, you know, in a, in a common circumstance. It takes something else going on in the model. And often it's a physician's actions that lead to an abatement of my affliction. Um, 
or it's, you know, an intervention that occurs. I am intervened upon by getting a fit test in the mail, or, you know, I see a message from Kologard, you know, um, inspiring me to action. Um, blue, somehow. I don't know why blue, but that, that was mentioned. So it's this... Cancer Awareness Month color. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, Truly. Yeah. No kidding. No yeah. kidding. Okay, I, I couldn't okay. pick this stuff up. Wow. <laughs> okay. So uh, pink for pink breast for cancer, breast cancer blue, blue for... Yeah. Okay. So, um, so here, you know, maybe an intervention like receipt of a message, exposure to a message would trigger me for, to go from one to the other. And if we look at the messages, which are, um, uh, which might be represented in, in Bryce's or Paul's or, or Cheyenne's um, models, you will often see these sort of things for interventions or for things where somewhere else in a person's situation, maybe it's someone, one of their neighbors tells them a horror story about their colonoscopy. They said, you know, I was sick as a dog for three days after it, and I took the prep, and it was the worst drink, you know, I've, I've had in my life, and it was the most traumatic experience I've had. And that, that's a message which sort of, you know, galvanizes me to be suspicious. So that might be represented as a message. It's some external trigger, typically, but not always strictly external to the person. It may just be to this state chart, but, but commonly external to the person as well, an intervention or the influence of another person. This is very common uh, for infectious disease models. Like um, in a stock and flow model, we just have a formula based on things like the prevalence of infection in the population, my number of contacts, uh, per per unit time and the probability of transmission from a contact that drives the number of new infections. That will depend through prevalence of infection on how many people are infectious. If there's no one infectious, I'm not going to catch an infection if I'm susceptible. And similarly, it depends on the number of susceptibles. If there's nobody susceptible, no one's going to get infected. In a stock and flow model, you have a formula giving how many people go from here to here per unit time? It's people per unit time within this. Within a, within a state chart, what we'll have instead is these message transitions. And um, I could uh, easily call up an example here, sort of similar to that one we saw. Um, I commonly teach dozens of, of um, these sorts of uh, models over the years. Um, so, excuse me, this is uh, example models. Um, and we might have, uh, uh, for example, an S, uh, SIR model. Um, this will be a, a sort of a, a very simple one for, for, um, uh, for our case of, of uh, infection at an individual level. So someone's susceptible. For them to become infectious, they need to be infected, and that's why you have this, this kind of external trigger in the form of this, uh, the form of this, uh, uh, this message transition, right? Um, so this diagram is roughly analogous to. This is at an individual level, roughly analogous to this at an aggregate level. This is kind of an aggregate way of approximating. It is approximating it. This doesn't capture networks in, in an exact way or doesn't capture spatial location, whereas something like this does. It, 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 you can put people in space and you can give people with networks. So here is an infection transition and you have some um, some recovery that's occurring over time, just as over here. So these are two different ways you might characterize an underlying system that are, are kind of comparable to one another, but they differ in their details. This is aggregate, most common with stock and flow models. This is a individual level representation, okay? So this is associated with a person. In the model that Paul showed, um, you may have noticed there was a person, but there was also a provider, a clinician. So we have actually, we can have 
one or more populations of agents. So there might be a population of people, but there might also be a population of provider. Or for an opioid model, there might be a population of, of dealers, you know, dealers of illicit opioids, doctors, so these would be clinicians, family members, uh, for example, who might be, uh, might be in the context of, uh, of this model. So, so in general, for an agent-based model, you'll want to think about what are the types of agents. Each agent, each type, say doctors, might have many particular agents associated with it. There's, you know, uh, there's Drew here, and there's Chris, and, and others in the room who are, who are doctors, um, but they're, they're all a clinician. Um, and so we might have one, one group called clinicians and another group called population members or persons. And there'll be rules to describe each of them with state charts that are different. Uh, physician behavior might be described with uh, the clinician, um, the clinician agent, whereas uh, a population member's behavior might be described with a person agent. Okay, so those are some some general features uh, of this. Um, in general, with model structure, we will have state charts and agent-based models describing a lot, and as you might have heard, you will additionally have sometimes uh, what are called variables. These are aspects of state as well. They're an aspect of my current situation. How many, how many counts of refills do I have in my, um, in my medicine, uh, or how many refills do I have on my, uh, my uh, OxyContin prescription? Or what's my dose level that I, I currently am delivered opioids at for my, uh, for my chronic pain? reflecting the fact this may change over time. They may bring up my dose levels with my tolerance, rising tolerance um, for my chronic pain. Um, I might have a number of doses remaining in my given refill. So that might be an aspect of my state here. You may remember Wade had number of colonoscopies a person has ever undergone. That was an aspect of their state as well. These were captured with what are called variables. That's the V here. V says, like, you know, that's, I have some particular number, say, for my dose level, or some particular number for my count of doses remaining, okay? Um, probably I should mention one other thing. We said in stock and flow models, there's a mixing process represented somewhat implicitly here. We kind of say, look, each person might meet on a per-year basis, you know, they have... Uh, they engage in um, uh, in activity, in sexual activity with, you know, on average 20 other partners. And with each partner, there's a certain probability of transmission. And we reason about averages typically with these aggregate models. With a stock and with a state chart model, we are more specific, um, an agent-based model, we're more specific than that. Typically, we represent networks. Okay, this is a part of structure of the model. So each person, for example, might be linked in to one or more networks. For example, I might be in a network with my family. These are family members, my brothers, my sisters, my, my parents, my children. But I might also have a link to, to clinicians, right? I might have a nurse practitioner that I see or, that a, or a, a physician, a doctor. Um, I might have a link to a dealer. I might be linked to dealers who provide me with my street, my street fentanyl, well, my fentanyl that I'm, I'm going to get, or they provide me with Percocet on the street. Um, so I might have a link to dealers. Um, so I, as an individual, frequent these two dealers. And if one of them is shut down by the police, I can still go to the other one. Or maybe... I'm in a rural area, there's only one around, and if, if he gets shut down, I can't get my Percocet. And I turn to, to you know, fentanyl, as provided by a dealer in, in Edmonton, big city. Um, there might also be connections between users. I know, I know a bunch of users who, who go to a shooting gallery with me, and I ask them, where do they get their stuff? And, and maybe I, I come to learn about new dealers through that. So the point is that 
often we put in model structure a specification of how are people connected in networks or in geography, okay? That's all part of model structure when it comes to agent-based models. That really doesn't come in much when it comes to uh, system dynamics models that are aggregate because here you're dealing with, at most, you might say susceptible people in Saskatoon, susceptible people in the nearest big city, Regina, you know, infectious Saskatoon, infectious Regina, temporarily immune in Saskatoon and, and Regina, or, you know, Minneapolis and St. Paul, or, or, or what have you. So there you might group people in an aggregate model into categories based on where they live, whereas in an, in an agent-based model, you actually can specify the location and their network, their specifics of their family situation, and that might allow me to take into account my decision-making, my family's beliefs, right? The beliefs or my history of my family. So these are often aspects of structure. And as a result, you know, when we run a model like this, I'll see if I can, if I can do this here. Um, uh, then, you know, we'll, we'll put it into, uh, into a geographic context, which allows us to see aspects of people's movement um, over the course of time uh, circulating around a particular geography. Oh, come on. Hey, hey, okay. There's, 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 the, de there's the dealers, okay. Um, oh, you, you want to, oh, okay, you want, you want to, I got plenty of you, um, but it's about time. It's about time, so um, it's actually, no, it's about 2 o'clock. And, and you don't have to go by a map, like you could, you could do it like you did this morning, like a simplification of a map where it's yeah. just urban, suburban, rural. Yeah. You could do it like that, which is really just stylized. It's, people don't live in concentric circles like that. It's just, this it's looks just like, like, that's right. this but that like one, the games that my kids play. Well, well I mean, it is. Now. There is. I mean, it's just <laughs> interesting. Like, they'll just switch them over these kind of person with their head, like the name of their head walking around. Yeah, well, it's true, and, and what you have to be careful is with, with uh, these sorts of models, as I said this morning, you have to be very careful what you, what you want to put into the model, because it means not putting in other things, right? And you, you just got to be very, very, uh, oh, sorry, wrong, running, running wrong, wrong model here. Um, you, you want to, um, you want to, say, okay, is it worth, for example, putting in a geographic context? In certain cases, it may be. If, it's, if I'm being exposed to certain types of, uh, for example, um, um, levels of, um, of you know, uh, particulate pollution based on my location over time, then my location might be very germane to understand my health trajectory. On the other hand, if we're dealing with sort of fairly Oh, yeah, I'll, sl I'll slow them down. This is Melbourne, Australia. Um, these are people going back and forth to convenience stores and grocery stores. And we can put in new grocery stores offering fresh fruits and vegetables and see how it impacts the behavior of, of uh, the, the health, health of the agents over time, as illustrated by, um, by, their, uh, by their weight and their... Um, and their propensity to eat um, unhealthy food or, or healthy food. This is another model which weaves together a stock and flow depiction at an individual level with state charts characterizing their evolution in a uh, categorical fashion. So here someone has a weight, a particular weight over time that varies continuously. Like and, going up. and, you know, I, I engage in, in uh, food seeking. I will want, I wanted to show this model, I want to show this model for one other item though. So here there's, you know, decision making going on. Where do I go to, a do I go to a convenience store or a supermarket based on their locations from my home? So I'm more likely to go to a convenience store for that, you know, milk and bread run if it's just across the street. Um, but if I have a nearby grocery store, maybe I'm, I'm more likely to go to that than a convenience store a little bit closer by um, because I can also get a greater variety of goods. And models like this in a geographic context can, can allow you to explicate those factors if it's critical to your model. What I wanted to show here though was one more language of model structure that you were exposed to. 
and then I want to switch over so that we can get any questions answered, but um, I wanted to go to the groups because I want to get the, the groups uh, showing some of their models. Hopefully this will expose you to some understanding on, of what's going on here. So here we have decision-making represented in what's called an action chart. Remember we saw this earlier? And the language was, um, was uh, formative in its character and, and, and imprecise. It said, you know, do I need an urgent screening? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, go for a colonoscopy. <laughs> you know, they wheel me in. Um, but um, the, the, the basic idea is it was representing a decision process on the part of agents. Um, there it was more on the part of a clinician who's guiding a particular or facilitating the, the health, um, uh, you know, the uh, episodes of care of a particular uh, population member. But here it might be characterized for a given person, for example, where do they eat, you know, and, and there might be considerations here. Do I have both a convenience store meal and a supermarket meal available? If so, I choose to go to preference. Otherwise, if I only have a convenience store meal, I eat it. Otherwise, you know, um, if I have only a supermarket meal, I, I eat only that. Otherwise, I I will go and actually um, I will actually go shopping for a meal. So um, in this case, this this represents a decision making process, and often this is a way that graphically the students can show in a model the choice process that they're representing, so they can get critique on it. Right? They can get feedback, oh, you're missing that, or you're using the wrong terminology for screening. That's exactly what we want these sort of diagrams to be able to elicit is, is pointing off when we need to change something. And that's what you offered, which is fantastic. It's just this is used to represent decision making on the part of an agent on a more or less an instantaneous basis, you know, how will I decide right now based on the situation? That situation might depend on my history, my reflection on my history. It might depend on my context. Where am I? What resources do I have access to? Who's in my social support network? But um, uh, it, it often will involve a series of kind of considerations that ultimately put me in a situation to make a certain choice. Maybe probabilistically, or commonly probabilistically, but sometimes uh, in a clear way. So, so this is a simplistic state chart that captuates, captures situated decision making on the parts of agents who are placed in space in a way that, whoa, in space in a way that, um, that uh, gives them access to certain resources more readily than another. Any questions on this before we transition back to student groups and reflecting the fact that we'll be able to come back to this uh, before with another lecture uh, as well uh, tomorrow and, and possibly we'll do something on, on Friday. Question. Question. Just on understanding the yeah. symbols and the, the yeah. symbols and things. Sure. So there was one dotted line off a decision triangle for yeah. the patient. Yeah. It was back in the decision making model. Yep. 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 Um, I'm trying to get an idea. What's that? It's the default. That's the default. If, so if it's not the other, then no one follows you. Okay, so if you don't make one of the decisions, then so, so for example, um, this one here, like when this person um, comes into the world, um, they, they enter one of these states with respect to this behavior change, commitment to behavior change. By default, they're placed here into maintenance, which is maybe not the best um, example to use, but that's kind of the default. If, if they don't go to another state, if if through successive coin flips they don't go to the action state or the, the pre-contemplation state or whatever, they'd end up in, in maintenance. Here, this maybe this is a little bit easier to understand. We have people coming in, and by default, if someone undergoes an overdose, they, they stay alive, but there's a certain risk of death. And so here, the basic deal is that for each of these diamonds. This represents a possibility, right? A, a possible outcomes. 
And in general, you will have two or more possible outcomes. One of them will be without privileging it, the default. So it'll just be if none of the others happen, that's what happens. Okay. The, the other ones, which are associated with, with uh, not dotted lines, with, with uh, uh, sort of uh, solid lines, those are successively considered you know, for their possible outcomes. Um, so maybe, maybe you know, the, the possibilities are um, uh, upon being offered by my clinician, being told I'm out of date with respect to my screening, I have a certain probability based on my history, based on my preferences, my fears, um, and my trust level in the physician, I have a certain probability of choosing a fit test. I have a certain probability of choosing a colonoscopy. But maybe I have a certain probability of saying, I'm not ready for this. You know, I've just got too much going on. Let's talk about it down the road. Um, and that maybe that's the, the default. The default doesn't mean it's most likely. It just means you sort of characterize the probability of each of the others or the rules to say under what conditions you'll go to these others. And that's the one that's kind of left. That's the one that's, that's, that's kind of uh, what you fall into if none of the others apply. Okay? Sometimes it is the most prevalent, like people in no pain. Um, are more common than those uh, post-operatively or, or chronic pain, but but it's not always the most prevalent. Is yeah. that is that helpful? Yeah. We're, okay. we're running low on time. Do Indeed. you want me to go get them because we're going to yeah. get backed up? Yeah, if we could get. Um, but I do want. Drew I would just the only thing you haven't explained that I've seen is the F category. What is the F where you see death rate? Oh yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so there's. Um, so this F, this is what's called a function, okay? This is basically where you put more involved logic or logic you don't want to distract people if it's in front of them and they see something scary, like a formula that they don't recognize. So you put it, and you give it a nice name. You say, this is my, this is the, in this case it could be named better, but probability that I'll die from overdose. Um, from from occurrence of an overdose, conditional on of having experienced an overdose, what's my probability of death? That's what that means, and it's a function. If we looked at it, here we go. If we looked at it, there's a there's a, a consideration here. Am I using prescribed opioids, or am I using street opioids? That may have a very big bearing on whether I you know, what the dosage is I'm getting, and therefore, by extension, whether it's matched to my tolerance level in a way that will allow me to survive, right? If my tolerance level is really waned and I'm using street fentanyl or something adulterated with fentanyl, I might die. So, so this is based on some logic, and it's actually based on some formulas here that are, that are involved and some reasoning and, and, and so on. Um, but the basic gist of it is that this is a bunch of logic that we encapsulate, we hide within a function. And then we can go look at it if we want to. Sure. But as a name, yeah. So how is that connected to uh, the overdose? Good question. There? It's connected in order to figure out my probability of death. You need I need that function. I actually do what's called call that function. I say, hey. Function, give me your, you know, give me the, your value, and I'll, I'll call it. I'll, I'll say, tell me what your value is, and it will do this, and it will return, you know, yeah. some probability or some probability or, or what have you. Um, for a former user, it's, it's zero, but if it's someone who's currently using, based on the situation, it will return a different number, and that's used to determine the probability of going this way versus that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, what this ignores is naloxone. You know, I, it, really, this should have naloxone. If the naloxone is available, I'm a lot less likely to die. There was a terrible case. Alan was telling me. Alan, Alan McLean, who you may have known as one of the TS, one of the student participants. He's um, he was someone who was a street outreach worker on Vancouver's east side, downtown east side, which is a real hotbed of um, 
of uh, those struggling with mental health and addictions issues. And he, he told us about one case in Vancouver who within 24 hours suffered 25 overdoses. Each time the ambulance came, they gave him naloxone, he recovered. And when you recover, you feel apparently a lot of craving because it's been driven out of your system, so you take again. And 25 times in 24 hours is, um, is, is horrendous, yeah. You need to just park the ambulance, huh? Yeah. So um, I think that, that, I don't know if this is helpful or not, but the person, doesn't it you agree that asked about the dotted line? Isn't that just else? Yeah, it's, and it's, it's really like just a leftover. If none of the others happen, this leftover, happens. But it's, a, it's more yeah. of an artifact. It makes the programming easier because you have to specify the other ones and then else that, right? That's, that's, that's right. Um, I, I will note that I haven't covered this condition, but there is a transition. Under a certain condition, go here. And that condition will differ from case to case, but it's like, uh, in this case, if they're a current user, they're taken out of the maintenance phase and they're put into the prep phase. Because they left. They, yeah, it's like a relapse sort of situation. It's sort of under this condition, are they, are they coming? Is that what you said? Question mark. This is a condition. Relapse always? No, it's a condition transition. This will fire under a certain condition. Like, if... if Specified condition. And then if you look under the question mark... Right. That's where it's hidden. For example, you might have a, although this model doesn't have it, you might have an overdose being declared if my level of tolerance-adjusted opioids in my system exceeds a given level, I then am in an opioid state. Or something. I mean, an overdose state. theoretical model, relapse yeah. is a function. Mm. Mm. So that's okay. what I was thinking it is. Yeah, uh, that, that is a form of relapse because they've gone into the current user... Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and, and oh, you got a Timbits. You got Timbits over there, yeah. Great deal. Timbits. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> got you every kind you can get. Thanks. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Can you get my note on the NBA? Is that too hard to do? To send them over to um, Caitlin. I just said oh, that awesome. to you. You were probably <laughs> out getting food when I asked. I was them. right up from one from one from Canadian to another. Oh, oh. Right, right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> are, are we trying to feed him or to kill him? This is a oh. real <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going there. Really Tomorrow afternoon, you get donuts too. Okay. 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 What? So, really stupid. Donut holes. But yeah. I've noticed there have been little yellow dots outside. I was going to ask that. So my box really counts, but they're not. Can you clarify the notation that is the... The little yellow dots. The little like the sunshine. Those are not the counts. Oh, so I was talking about Robin's donuts. No. Okay. Um, really? Robin's donuts has... Uh, you? Robin Eggs. Oh, yeah, we heard that. So Robin <laughs> Eggs and the other ones. Yeah, Tim Benson and Robin <laughs> Eggs are the same thing. Would you like also called donut holes. They don't have a hole in them. Donut holes are in the, in the States? That's what they call them. Yeah, they're called donut holes. Yeah, donut holes in the States, and here they're, they're in the States. Really, they're not really holes. It's a misnomer. It's the plug. It's the plug. It's the hole. It's the hole. But it's the hole that's made the hole. Right. Dunkin' Donuts cause a munchkin. Munchkin? That's true. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, these are diagrammatic things I think are used to illustrate important changes that to draw your attention to some of these. But, but I, I've got to double check. Here, here they go. Here, because I'm actually I don't tend to use these. And Alex or Young might actually know how do we use these little suns? Little yellow dots. Yeah. Because I think these are used to draw attention to things. They're called street lights. Mm. Yeah. In, they're called what? Street lights. Street lights. Yeah. I, I, it, Those little sunshine. Is it yeah. related yeah. to the base 3D uh, yeah. representation? Yeah, I thought it was only 3D. Oh, okay. Yeah, they need a light. Yeah. Oh, they need a light shining on them. Yeah, and then. Well, I'll be. Okay. Maybe. I'm not sure. So in, if you can have 3D representations of people moving around, and it has to do with the camera, like like how bright they are. Yeah. What did you intend to use it for? Oh, I don't know. It was just in here. But we asked him, what does that mean? And so what you're saying is just more or less how you represent it. So have you ever seen like a game engine, for example?